Luke chapter 24. Um, this morning I was speaking about uh, gospel from uh, resurrection from John's point of view, and one of the things we saw is that Jesus rose from the dead, and he was seen first of all by the women who were much more faithful and zealous to seek the Lord at this time uh, in the morning. And I suggested that uh, the men, the disciples, had actually fled to, most likely to Beth- Bethany, when Jesus was arrested, though Peter and John had gone into Jerusalem. And during the day, Mary Magdalene, the women, had gone to assemble the disciples and to bring them together in Jerusalem, where they met with the risen Lord. So we're going to read, actually, the uh, meeting with the Lord uh, in Luke 24, verse 33. And then I'm going to speak about basically on the theme of the resurrection in Judaism and in Christianity. Remembering, of course, that Jesus and the disciples were all Jewish. (laughs) Let's just have a word of prayer as we come to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you bless the reading and the speaking of your word and help us to understand this subject. We pray in the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Okay, let's start at verse uh, 33. This is actually the people on the Emmaus Road as they go back to Jerusalem. So they rose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he has made known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts appear in, rise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So he gave them, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is necessary, thus it was necessary, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The verse I really want you to think about is verse 44, where it says, Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written, which must be fulfilled, were written in the law of Moses, in the Torah, in the prophets, the Nevi'im, and in the Psalms, the Chetuvim concerning me. Torah, Nevi'im, Chetuvim are the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, and they come together in the word Tanakh, which is what Jewish people call the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, from the first letter, Torah, ne- Nevi'im, Chetuvim. And Jesus was Jewish, and he was coming to his Jewish disciples and explaining to them from the Hebrew Scriptures how he had just fulfilled them. Therefore, that they should believe in him as the Messiah. And this was something which was fundamental to our understanding, the Jewishness of Jesus, the Jewishness of the resurrection, and the Jewishness of the New Testament. Do Jewish people believe that today? Some do. Most don't. And I want to talk today actually about some of the objections to this from the Jewish point of view, and also the whole issue of resurrection in Christianity and in Judaism. Uh, When you come to the subject of resurrection, it's actually a vital subject for every person on the face of the earth. Whatever religion, whatever race they come from, every person on the face of this earth is going to die one day, unless Jesus comes first and takes us in the rapture of the church. Therefore, death is something which we all face. What happens after death? Do we just uh, die and rot in the ground and that's the end of it? Are we reincarnated and come back as a Somebody else? Or is there a resurrection to life, eternal life, and a resurrection to damnation, eternal separation from God? And it's a very important question, I'm sure you agree, that we need to find an answer to. Most people actually try to avoid it because it makes them uncomfortable. 
In fact, uh, it's said that in the 19th century, the subject you never talked about was sex. In the 20th, 20th and 21st century, most people don't want to talk about death because it makes them uncomfortable. But as I said, you can't avoid it. And it raises an issue, and it raises issues also with Judaism and modern Judaism. And since we're here in the middle of a Jewish area, it might be helpful just to know something about how it relates to Jewish people. Uh, there's a book called 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus by a man called Asher Norman. I've referred to this in the past, and it's a book which tells you, if you're Jewish, not to believe in Jesus, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and Asher Norman said these words, he said, Christianity stands or falls by the so-called resurrection accounts in the Christian Bible. There is no concept in the Jewish Bible that the Messiah, Ben David, will die before completing his mission, be resurrected, or be a deity. Okay, so he says there's no concept of a Jewish Messiah who's going to die, be resurrected, or be a deity, be a divine person. He then proceeds to discredit the resurrection accounts in the New Testament. I'm not going to go into all that because it's about 40 pages of an article which I've done, which you will find on the Messiah Factor website. I'd have done a website called Messiah Factor, which answers some of these questions. So if you want to look up uh, messiahfactor.com, resurrection accounts, you'll find my article on that. So, Asher Norman says, Christianity stands or falls by the resurrection accounts. Is he right? Yes. <laughs> Christianity does stand or fall by the resurrection. If Jesus is not risen, then forget it. Your faith is futile, go home, and it's got really nothing to offer. And unfortunately, much of the church today has actually really denied the central truths, and so they're offering Jesus as a kind of glorified social worker who tells you to go and do some good deeds and uh, hopefully earn your way to heaven. But biblical Christianity stands or falls by the resurrection of Jesus. Paul said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. It's a central event which we believe in. And believing not just in a kind of faith experience of the disciples, but believing that Jesus literally died, his body was taken down from the cross and was buried, and his body literally arose from the dead uh, in a resurrection body. Also, by definition, if you believe in Jesus, when you die, uh, your body will die and we be put in the ground in some form, and your spirit will return to God and you will be resurrected. And so there is a belief in not just in the resurrection of Jesus, but also in the resurrection of the individual, the believer who believes in Jesus. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15... Uh, these words, he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, <clears throat> that Christ, or Messiah, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, but he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the Twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the Apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me, also as one born out of due time. Every the word seen, that means that they literally saw Jesus risen, risen from the dead. It wasn't just a faith experience, it was seeing a person before them who was resurrected. And in this passage in Luke's Gospel we just read, we read about how Jesus appeared to the disciples, uh, they could see him, they could touch him, uh, they could see him eating fish, uh, and they could see him physically there before them. And uh, the New Testament, on the basis of this verse, asserts very strongly that Jesus is the promised Messiah who died for our sins and rose again from the dead. And that after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days before ascending into heaven. And he will return to the earth sometime later at the second coming. Meantime, he sends the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. But through his resurrection, anyone who believes in Jesus and repents and believes the gospel, will themselves experience resurrection and eternal life. And this does mean that the Bible clearly teaches there is a life after death, there is a heaven, there is a hell, and that either we will be present with the Lord in heaven or absent from him in hell. So from that point of view, it's a huge issue. And you'd think that every person on the face of the earth, if they understood this, would do everything they could to make sure that they're going to heaven. Uh, be a pretty logical thing to do, wouldn't it? But people raise all sorts of objections and they spend most of their time trying to avoid it or to argue against it 
and to say that it's not true. And of course, Judaism does not believe this, or Orthodox or Reformed Judaism uh, don't believe, and there are issues which are raised within Judaism of life after death, resurrection, and also whether the Messiah himself brings the resurrection from the dead. We're going to look today mainly at the subject of does uh, Judaism and the Old Testament teach that there will be a resurrection from the dead? Uh, is it in the Old Testament? Is it in the prophets, in the Tanakh? Uh, now, most scriptures which we would use to preach about the resurrection are to be found in the New Testament, uh, in the words of Jesus. And Jesus actually has the definitive word on this subject. And it's the reason why he does have the definitive word, because Jesus has come from heaven to tell us about it. He's come from the other side, if you like, to tell us what we don't know and what we can't work out by our own understanding. So whenever Jesus speaks about this subject, he's got authority, uh, because he's come down from heaven to tell us all about it. John chapter 3, when he's talking to a uh, very religious Jewish man, a leader of the Jews called Nicodemus, he says to him in verse 12, John 3, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one's ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. So Jesus is a unique person who has come down from heaven to tell us about this subject. And we have a lot of words in the Gospel of John particularly where he says uh, in chapter 5, verse 25, Verse 24, John 5, verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those who hear will live as the Father has life in himself. So he has granted the Son to have life in himself has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation or damnation. I can, do nothing of my, uh, can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Uh, Either you believe that or you don't believe it. You can't really <laughs> sort of argue what it means. Jesus is very clear what he means. He says that there is going to be a resurrection. Everyone who's in the grave is going to rise from the grave, or even if they're not in the grave, even if they've been cremated, they're going to rise to, uh, at the last day. And there's going to be a resurrection to life, life which means eternal life in him, and a resurrection to damnation which means eternal separation from God. And Jesus has the authority and the power to do this. The only ways he has the power and authority to do this if he is the Son of God, if he's equal with the Father. Uh, so he's not just a prophet, he's not just a good man, he is God made flesh who has the power and the authority to exercise judgment. And in John chapter 11, Jesus says to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Uh, if you do, then you have life. If you don't, you don't have life. It's very simple. It's not a, you don't need to be a PhD or even go to Bible college to work it out. Uh, Jesus says very clearly, either you believe and you have life, or you don't believe and you don't have life. And Martha said, yes, I believe you are the Messiah who has come into the world. Now, if you're a believer, then you do. But if you are following any form of Judaism around here, whether it's Orthodox Hasidic or Reform, Judaism, you'll be told not to believe this. That is one of the big no-nos, uh, to believe that Jesus is the one who will give you life uh, and that Jesus has come to tell us about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, so what does the Judaism and what does the Old Testament, the Tanakh, teach us about the subject of resurrection? We have to acknowledge there's not so much about it as there is in the New Testament. In fact, in the Torah, the five books of Moses, which are the basis on which particularly Orthodox Judaism is founded, there is no direct reference to life after death. There's one oblique reference, which I'll give you, which Jesus uses in a moment. Uh, 
And there are passages in the prophets we're going to look at in a moment. As a result of this, Judaism itself is much less clear on this subject than biblical Christianity. There are 13 articles of faith in Judaism, and the 13th article is, I believe, in the resurrection of the dead. And Jewish people would say, I believe that there is uh, a better reward in Olam Haba, in the world to come. And there is this also an idea of some kind of punishment. Uh, generally, the idea is that on the Day of Judgment, your good deeds will be poured into one side and your bad deeds will be poured into the other side. So you have the defending angel who pour your good deeds onto your right-hand side of the scales and the accusing angel who put your bad deeds onto the uh, def accusing uh, side of the scales. And depending on which way they go, if you've got more good deeds than bad deeds, you're okay. If you've got more bad deeds than good deeds, you're in Stuck. Okay? That's pretty much what every religion believes, by the way, including much of nominal Christianity. So you've got to do some good deeds to cancel out your bad deeds. There's a rather charming Yiddish story, actually, about a man who dies, appears before God, and his good deeds are weighed out, and his bad deeds are weighed out, and the scales come dead level. So what happens is he has to go back to the earth and to suffer a little bit uh, more so that he can get some credit, so he'll have uh, more on the good side, and he'll go into the good part of Olam Haba. But having said that, it's not really something which is a major study in Judaism. Uh, there's a rabbi called Rabbi Louis Jacobs. I got this off his website. Uh, and he, he says basically that uh, resurrection is believed on, but it's not something which we take a huge amount of interest in. And you meet a lot of Jewish people who have said to me, you know, that uh, you Christians, you're all concerned about life after death. We're concerned about living a good life down here. Uh, we should also be concerned about living a good life down here, but we do believe we are concerned about what happens after death. Now, this is something which Louis Jacob says. It says, Resurrection is the doctrine that in a future age the dead will rise from their graves and live again. The doctrine appears frequently in Jewish eschatology, where it is associated with the doctrine of the Messiah and the immortality of the soul. It says, There's no systematic treatment in rabbinic literature of the doctrine of resurrection any more than there is in any other theological topic. The ancient rabbis were organic rather than systemic thinkers. Nevertheless, the picture which emerges from the numerous thoughts in this literature is of a three-stage series of events. First of these is the state of the soul in heaven after the death of the body. The second stage is the messianic age here on the earth at the end of days. The third stage is that of the resurrection of the dead. Unlike the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, the belief in the resurrection was nationalistic rather than individualistic. It was the hope of a national revival that came to the fore and embraced the resurrection. After the restoration of the Jewish people to its homeland in the days of the Messiah, it was believed that the resurrection of the dead would take place. Uh, so there's an idea of the Messiah coming, restoring the Jews to Israel, and then the resurrection of the dead takes place. But he does go on to say that Jewish views on this subject are not totally clear or unified. There's a very famous uh, Jewish teacher called Maimonides who wrote a book called The Guide to the Perplexed, which is a kind of standard book for understanding Judaism, written in the Med Med Middle Ages. Uh, Louis Jacob says in Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed, there is no reference at all to the doctrine of resurrection. One or two stray references to the re resurrection in Maimonides' code, but on the whole he seems to identify the rabbinic world to come, not with the resurrection, but with the immortality of the soul. And there's a debate about whether the soul will enter a resurrected body or will live on in some kind of immortality. Uh, the Talmud, which is explanations of this, actually discourages speculation on the nat nature of life after death, saying we will consider the matter when they come to life again. In other words, don't bother to think about it now because you can't work it out. And you have a number of different thoughts on this subject. Um, basically, Orthodox Judaism clearly does believe in the resurrection of the dead because it uh, refers to it in its daily prayers. Uh, when a Jewish person dies, they have a Kaddish recited by a son at the funeral of the parent, and there are explicit references there to the resurrection of the dead. And also memorial prayers recited by Orthodox uh, references to the soul of the departed being at rest beneath the wings of the Shekinah, God's presence. Uh, Reformed Judaism in the 19th century went the whole way in rejecting the doctrine of the resurrection in favor 
of that of the immortality of the soul. In reform book, prayer books, passages in the traditional prayer book to the resurrection have either been deleted or interpreted as referring to the immortality of the soul. Uh, of course, there are a lot of Jewish atheists and humanists and agnostics who deny the existence of God and life after death as well. There's also a very curious belief which you might be surprised at in reincarnation. Uh, there's a group called Chabad, which is Lubavitch. I remember having a long conversation with a man who was into the Lubavitch movement about reincarnation. I was quite surprised to believe that he did believe in reincarnation. And I found an article on the Chabad website which says that reincarnation is a belief of Judaism. It says there are many aspects of what they call Gilgul HaNeshamot, reincarnation of the soul. It goes on to say there are some sins for which the cleansing in the spiritual realm alone does not suffice. Thus souls who have sinned and have not properly repented whilst alive are sometimes forced to undergo a second round of life in this world as rehabilitation for sins previously committed. Okay, so if you haven't done well enough in this life, you come back and try again. Uh, it also says that reincarnation provides an opportunity for souls to perform those commandments they were unable to do in a previous incarnation. Uh, Talmudic Judaism actually teaches that there are 613 commandments which a, uh, are found in the Torah, which uh, should be kept. And it says, usually a soul does not manage to fulfill all the commandments in one go, must repeatedly be reincarnated until it has fulfilled them all. Okay, so if you don't manage to do it first time around, you come back again and try again. And it then goes on to say, there are some souls who do not descend for their own growth or perfection. Rather, the only reason they return to this earth is to benefit others. This can be to help out an individual or the entire generation spiritually or materially. Uh, the article actually says that reincarnation happens as many times as is necessary to fulfill the perfection of the soul. But if you fail to make any rectification in your second or third uh, reincarnation, after three strikes, you're out. So you've got three goes at it. If you don't make any uh, improvement after the third strike, too bad, you've lost. Uh, so it says a soul that has reincarnated three times without having rectified anything at all is not reincarnated again. Uh, which would imply that they're forever doomed. However, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, who is a great authority on this subject, explained that only reincarnations into human beings is limited to three strikes and you're out. These souls will continue to be reincarnated, first as kosher animals, then in decreasing order as known kosher animals, plants, and even as inanimate objects, as long as the need exists. So that's a teaching of Chabad Judaism. And uh, it hopes that eventually, through this process, you'll be reunited to the source and get back to God. Um, now, I, when I read this article, I put a comment on it, which I do sometimes, and I like to kind of communicate with them. I said that actually uh, there's nothing in the Bible which says anything about reincarnation. Uh, it does say that these are Eastern ideas, which are forbidden, actually. In the book of Isaiah, it says, uh, you, the people, the house of Jacob, are filled with Eastern ways. Uh, they are soothsayers like the Philistines, they're pleased with the children of foreigners. In other words, God doesn't approve of this idea. That's Isaiah 22, verse 6. And I quoted Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, which says, It is appointed unto man to die once, and after this the judgment. So Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many. In other words, you get one crack at this life, not many. Uh, and if you don't make it through the first time, that's it. That's why it's important that now is the day of salvation and you believe in Yeshua. Uh, unfortunately, my comment has not been put on the Chabad website. But somebody must have read it, so praise God, we hope so. Now, let's look at the Bible then. When you look at the Bible, you find that actually there was not a great deal about this subject, as I said, in the Old Testament, especially in the Torah. When you come to the time of Jesus, you find that one of the arguments between Jesus' opponents, actually the Sadducees and the Pharisees, was over this very subject. Is there a life after death? Is there a resurrection? Uh, two references, particularly in Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus is challenged by the, Pharisees, the Sadducees, and in Acts 23, when Paul is before the council, and he says that I'm a Pharisee, and because of the belief in the life after death, in the resurrection of the dead, I'm before you. 
which set off a big row between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Acts chapter 23. Uh, let's look at Matthew 22. Uh, the Pharisees, sorry, the Sadducees. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees don't. Uh, the Sadducees actually were the people who were concentrating their uh, worship and their, uh, their whole religious life around the temple worship, uh, the sacrifices, and basically believe the five books of Moses and not much else. So they, their religion was really confined to the Torah, the five books of Moses. So the same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died and he had married, and having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum commented on this and said it wasn't so much a theological question, but it should be a question for the police department. What was this woman putting in the soup that all her husbands kept dying? But uh, it was actually a religious question. So what does Jesus answer? He said, Jesus answered and said to them, you're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. As I said, the Sadducees took the Torah as their, uh, the, the part which was significant to them. So Jesus had to say, speak to them something out of the Torah. So he's speaking out of Exodus, and he refers to the burning, book passage, burning bush passage, and Moses, before the burning bush, confronts the Lord, or the Lord confronts him. And he says, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. What's the point of that? Uh, well, God is the living God, and he's speaking to Moses, who is living some 400 years plus after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob basically are living. You see that? Therefore, there has to be some resurrection which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have gone through. Therefore, there is a life after death. That was the argument. Uh, Jesus also spoke about the uh, the rich man and Lazarus being in Abraham's bosom in Luke chapter 16. So there's some connection between Abraham being alive and Abraham uh, who died many years before Moses and before Jesus being alive today. So you have this uh, statement which Jesus brings. Okay, let's have another look at another scripture. As I said, in the Torah there's no direct statement. If anyone can find one, let me know, but I've never found one, which says there is a resurrection from the dead. This is an inference Jesus makes from Exodus. There's no direct statement you'll find anywhere in the five books of Moses saying there is a resurrection from the dead. There are, however, several passages in the prophets and in the other parts of the Bible. Let's have a look at some of them. One of the most remarkable is in the book of Job. And that's actually not on there, so don't look at it. Uh, but in the book of Job, chapter 19, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, for he shall stand at the last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. What happens after your skin is destroyed? You're dead, yeah? So he's saying, after I've died, I'm going to see God. How is he going to see God? And you're going to see God if he is resurrected from the dead. And he says, also, I know that my Redeemer lives... And of the last day he shall stand on the earth. So who's his redeemer? He didn't know him by name, but we know his name by name now. It's Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. So he's saying, I know that my redeemer lives, and he's going to come in the person of Jesus and stand on the earth. And after I've died, I'm going to be resurrected and see God. So here is what some people think is the oldest book in the Bible, which has a very clear reference to resurrection in it. Let's look at another passage in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. It says, remember, this is verse 6 of Ecclesiastes. 
Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosened, before the golden ball is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the wheel. Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. So uh, the first verse 6 is actually a very poetic description of death. So when the golden bowl is broken and the pitcher shattered, basically speaking about when you're no longer here, when you're dead. It says the dust, uh, the physical body will return to the God who gave it, and the spirit will return to God who gave the spirit. So you have a body and a spirit. Your body is going to return to the dust of the earth. Your spirit is going to return to God. So here is a statement about something which is going to happen after death in which the spirit part of you leaves your body and returns to God. Uh, And the Bible speaks very clearly that we do have a a physical body and a spirit part of us. What makes us different from the animals? The animals just have a body and they have a kind of soul, but they don't have the spirit part of us, which is to relate to God. Uh, In Genesis chapter 2, The creation account, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. So the man became a living being, so he had a physical nature. He also had a spiritual nature which came from God. And the spiritual and the physical will be separated. And when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel at this that I said to you, you must be born again. So the Bible, both Old and New Testament, tells you that you and I and every human being on the face of the earth has a spirit part of us as well as a physical part of us. A lot of people who deny that, but whether they deny it or not, there is a space within each one of us which is the spirit part which is made to be filled with God, with the Holy Spirit. And through faith in Jesus, you can be born again and receive the Holy Spirit and therefore be ready to meet God when you die. Uh, That's the good news of the gospel. But what it's saying is there is a life after death. Okay, let's look at another passage, quite a controversial one, this one. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, the end of the book of Samuel, um, Saul, the king, is in big trouble. He's lost his anointing, he's lost his fellowship with God, and he's about to face a battle with the Philistines, and he's frightened, and he doesn't know what to do. And he goes to a medium, known as the Witch of Endor. And he goes to the medium to ask him, the medium to consult with a spirit. I'll say a bit about that in a moment. Let's just read what it says. 1 Samuel 28, verse 1. The verse 8. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and, with, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know that Saul, what Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you snare a snare for me, for my life, and cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? The woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I'm deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me. God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I've called you up that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, why do you ask me seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey his voice, voice of the Lord, nor execute fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord also will deliver the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. 
very curious story because if you uh, read through Deuteronomy, you'll know that mediums and consulting with the dead is forbidden. So please don't think that uh, I'm reading this, you can go home and uh, start talking to the dead or trying to consult the dead through a seance because you mustn't, it's forbidden. And if you do try and do that, you won't consult with the dead. You'll consult with an evil spirit who will be impersonating the dead and may actually have some information which will convince you that it really is your dead auntie or something. Uh, but it won't be. It'll be an evil spirit. Uh, so uh, the Bible does not in any way endorse spiritism and consulting with the dead. Uh, this was a unique occasion. And we can see that it was unique because the woman who was the medium was even more surprised than Saul was when Samuel came up. She wasn't used to someone actually appearing. Uh, she was really shocked by this. But notice what uh, Samuel says. She saw a spirit descending from the earth, and in verse 15, the Saul said to, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Uh, so it's clearly it is Samuel who's come up, and he says he's been disturbed from where he was. So he was in the place of the dead, and now he's appeared to Saul. And he gives him a message. And he knows who Saul is, and he knows who David is, and he gives him information which is relevant to what's about to happen. Uh, so what this story tells you uh, is that there is a continuation of life after death. That Samuel has died already, and now he's been summoned back to life, and he's still Samuel. Uh, he's still someone who knows who Samuel is, and he knows who Saul is, and he knows who David is. So it tells you that there is a life after death. Now, whether you... I say, please don't take this story as a model for what you should do. I just quote it because it is a clear example from the Old Testament that there is a belief in the Hebrew Scriptures in life after death, uh, in resurrection. Okay, so let's look at some of the words from the prophets. And I'll go through this fairly quickly, but these are scriptures which tell you from the prophetic writings that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Uh, in Isaiah, there are two or three passages. We'll read a couple of them. Isaiah 25, verse 6. Isaiah 25, it says, He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. In his Yeshua, actually. His Jesus. So he's going to swallow up death forever. So there's going to be a case, time, when God is going to change death into life. Following chapter in chapter 26, verse 19, it says, Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out her dead. Uh, it's an interesting verse that it says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. Now, other versions say with your dead body, but if it says my dead body, who is the my who is going to rise and who's going to bring others with him to rise from the dead? We can't say definitely this is a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus, but I think it comes pretty close. It says someone's going to rise... And as a result of this one who's died and risen, he's going to bring others to life. And also that the earth is going to cast out her dead. So it's speaking about something to do with the resurrection of the dead uh, through somebody who rises. The next verse is also very interesting. It says, come, my people, enter your chambers, shut the doors behind you, hide yourselves for a little moment until the indignation is past before, behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will cover, no more cover her slain. Uh, so God is saying that there's going to be a time when God's going to take people out of the earth and take them into a safe place while he brings judgment on the world. Does that remind you of anything which is going to happen according to the New Testament? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and you have the Lord taking his people out of the world, I believe, before the Great Tribulation begins. Now you can't say that's a definite prophecy of the rapture of the church, but it is kind of interesting and the rapture of the church is also something to do with the resurrection of the dead of the believer okay let's uh, perhaps we'll leave Ezekiel because time's going on but Ezekiel's dry bones is another picture of the uh, resurrection some have said no I will read it's interesting Ezekiel 37 
Then the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out of the spirit in the spirit of the Lord, set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews in you and bring flesh upon you and cover you, your, you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And then he prophesies, they come together. And in verse 11 it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Uh, interesting prophecy. Uh, works on two levels. Some have said it's a picture, actually, of the present restoration of Israel. So God brings the people back physically to the land, and then he has a purpose at the end of days to uh, move upon them spiritually, cause them to become a great army uh, before the Lord as the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So we have first a physical birth, then a spiritual birth. Others have said this is actually a picture of the resurrection of the dead at the time of the Messiah. So the Messiah comes to Israel and the resurrection of the dead takes place. But clearly it is some kind of a resurrection because it's speaking about dry bones, dead bones coming together and having life within them. And another passage in Daniel. This is probably one of the clearest passages on the resurrection in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Uh, speaks about a time uh, at the time of the Great Tribulation, time of trouble such as has not been before or ever shall be. If you look at the New Testament, Jesus speaks about this in Matthew 24, about the time of great tribulation, unlike any that has been before or ever shall be. And it says also that at this time, uh, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. So there's going to be a resurrection to life, a resurrection to condemnation. And Daniel's told to shut up the words, seal the book till the time of the end, and it shall run to and fro, but knowledge shall increase. So it has something to do with the time of the end, uh, time of the coming of the Messiah, and the resurrection of the dead. Then at the end of chapter 12, it says, You, verse 9, go your way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. And I'm not going to try and explain the 1,335 days. There is an explanation to that. It's kind of interesting, but it would take too long. <laughs> <clears throat> but what he's saying here is to Daniel is that you go your way these things are going to come to pass and at the end of days you are going to be resurrected so he says go your way you will arise to your inheritance at the end of days which tells you there will be a resurrection of the righteous from the Old Testament times at the end of days so again all these scriptures are telling you that there will be a resurrection and they're implying also it's a re literal resurrection and a bodily res resurrection so Daniel will be resurrected as Daniel. Uh, so he will be recognizable as the prophet Daniel. And others from the Old Testament period will be resurrected. And there's also a concept uh, in the uh, 
coming of the Messiah to the Mount of Olives. You know that anyone been to the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem? You know what there is at the Mount of Olives? There's a big graveyard. And it's a place where Orthodox Jews want to be buried uh, because they believe that when the Messiah comes, he's going to blow a trumpet, and the people who are nearest to the Messiah when he blows the trumpet will be the first to rise from the dead. Uh, so it's a good, prestigious place to be buried. Uh, now, actually, we believe that the dead in Christ will rise first, but uh, that's another issue. But certainly, this concept of resurrection is there in Judaism, and there is a hope in the resurrection of the dead. It may not be quite so clear as it is in the New Testament, but there are even passages which speak about a new heavens and a new earth, uh, and even one which speaks about a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, uh, which you'll find in Isaiah 66, uh, parallel to New Testament passages on heaven and hell. But what about the Messiah, and how does it relate to Jesus? Now, the traditional Jewish response would be say that all this is about the Messiah when he comes and he's going to bring the resurrection of the dead. The Christians would say that the resurrection has already, the one who's bringing the resurrection has already come in the person of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And this is another issue which I'm not going to go into in detail today because that's another topic which we will look at how the Messiah brings resurrection. But one passage we will look at, which is Psalm 16, which is quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Psalm 16, verse 9, it says, Therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh will also rest in hope. If you will not leave me in Sheol, that's the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So Sheol is the place of the dead. Uh, in New Testament terms, it is Hades, not Gehenna. Gehenna is the place of the dead for the damned, but Sheol is the place which has, in New Testament terms, in uh, Luke 16, a good compartment, Abraham's bosom, uh, where the righteous go, and a bad compartment uh, where the rich man goes and is in torment. So uh, at the end of days, Jesus is going to empty... Uh, actually, some believe he's already emptied the good compartment and taken those who are there to heaven. People in the bad compartment of Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. That's another big subject. I won't go into that in detail. But what's important here is that Jesus is... Peter refers to this as referring to Jesus. You will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So if Sheol is the place of the dead, the place where the body sees corruption, then this one he's speaking of here is not going to be allowed to stay there. And Jesus, who is the Son of God, was put into the grave. According to my understanding, his spirit then went to Sheol, the good part of Sheol, and he proclaimed things, and he emptied part of it. We don't know for sure, but he was uh, certainly conscious during the time between his death and his resurrection. And then at the resurrection, his spirit returned into the body, and Jesus then burst out of the tomb alive in the resurrection body. So you have an event which took place. And Peter refers to this in the Acts chapter 2, verse 29, where he says, Concerning this, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. His tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah, the Christ, to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. But David did not ascend into heavens, but he says of himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah." And when they heard this, they were all cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So who's the one who rose from the dead? It's Jesus. He didn't see corruption. He didn't stay in the tomb. Because he's God, he couldn't remain dead. He had to come back to life. And having come back to life uh, in the resurrection of the dead, he appeared to the disciples. They witnessed it. And now they're telling people what they should do about it. He says, this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And who crucified Jesus? Actually, we all did because Jesus died for our sins. Uh, Church has actually said that the Jews crucified Jesus, therefore they're under a curse. That's not the case at all. There were Jews who were for Jesus. Those were Jews who were against Jesus. Uh, and Peter was probably talking to some of the Jewish religious leaders who were responsible for the death of Jesus, telling them that they'd made a mistake. They should repent and believe in Jesus. But the fact is that every one of us is guilty of the death of Jesus because Jesus died for our sins and we're all sinners. But we can all be forgiven if we repent and believe the gospel. And that's what he wants of us. He says, the promise is to you and your children, to all as many as the Lord our God will call. So Jesus did literally die and rise from the dead and is prophesied here in the scriptures. And because he died and rose from the dead, therefore those who believe in him will also rise from the dead in the resurrection. And so the Bible, both Old and New Testament, speak about the resurrection of the dead. In the Old Testament, it's a bit veiled. It's not as clear as it is in the New Testament, but it's there. And in the Old Testament, it points us to the Messiah who has come to redeem us. Now, I haven't even looked into the prophecies like Isaiah 53, which we will look at at some other time. But there are so many prophecies in the Hebrew Scriptures which point us to Yeshua being the one who has died for our sins, was buried and rose again from the dead. And in him we can have eternal life. So believe on Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And the Bible does indicate that the Messiah will die and rise from the dead. Asher Norman's wrong when he says that it's not possible, not Jewish. It is there in the Hebrew Scriptures. And just one quote to finish with. Uh, Jesus spoke to Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Do you believe this? Yes. Good. If you don't, now is the day of salvation. And there may be somebody here or somebody listening to this talk who does not believe in Yeshua the Messiah. If you do, then you have eternal life through faith in him. Your sins are forgiven, and you can look forward to a glorious resurrection. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear judgment, because the price has been paid through Jesus the Messiah, who died for us on the cross. It's there in the Old Testament. It's, in some ways, it's a bit hidden. But in the New Testament, it's revealed in the person of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And our prayer is that... Uh, as well as all of us here and Christians, that Jewish people around us may also recognize that Jesus is the Messiah who came to redeem us. He is the one who paid the price, and he's the one who died and rose from the dead. So believe on Yeshua the Messiah, and you will be saved. Amen. 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 Let's just have a word of prayer, then we'll close. So Lord, we do thank you for these scriptures, and we thank you that your word is clear. And it points to Jesus, the Messiah. Thank you that you are the Saviour who died for us and rose from the dead. And we pray, Lord, that your word will go out to the Jewish people and they will understand who you are and believe on Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Amen.